morning. Is this on? Yes. So my name is Lisa Carnoy, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. So thank you for spending our time with us today. And because this is a breakout, and because I have a strong view that I'm going to learn a lot from each of you, and you can learn from each other, I'm also going to ask you a lot of questions. So I hope you're feeling ready to participate and share some of your thoughts. So my first question is, how many of you have a sense of what you want to do for your career? Wow. Anyone want to share what, what you'd like to do? All the way in back. OK, I can't hear you. A little louder. Wonderful. Anyone else? Right here. Corporate lawyer? Therapist? Wonderful. One last one. Right here. Wow. OK, so that's amazing. And I will tell you that when I was in college, I thought I might be a history professor, or maybe I would work in advertising. Um, and frankly, in my senior year, I couldn't get a job in advertising, and went to a number of different presentations on campus, and fell in love with something that if you had asked me at the time would I end up working in banking, I probably would have fallen off my chair. I had taken no econ classes, no finance classes, no accounting classes, but when I visited the presentations for the banking programs, I thought, that seems interesting, that seems challenging, and it seems like an environment where I could thrive. So one of the things I wanted to share with you is how to really think about the content of the work, the environment, the culture, where each of you can find your kicks, if you will, uh, and success at work. So the first topic, let me see if I uh, have these slides, and you have a worksheet, is really to think about what it is in the content of the work. Are you someone that likes to do coding? Are you someone that likes serving customers? Are you someone that likes to create things that are visually um, beautiful? Are you someone that um, likes to write long reports? Really take this opportunity to write on the worksheet what are the things that you love doing and that you are great at doing because that's certainly a component of where you might be successful in your career. Do you know you like to be outside and maybe be a ship captain? Do you know you like helping people and therefore being a counselor? Do you know you want to lead large groups of people as an executive? So maybe take a chance to think of, you know, what are the two or three things that I love doing and that people tell me I'm good at? Because if, you know, if your teachers, if your professors, if your advisors say, gosh, you really are amazing as an artist, are you really remarkable in writing papers, or you do a great job leading a team, those are things that can help you think about your career. And sometimes you don't know what it is that you're good at, how does that fit in with a job choice, but I am quite sure that there are job choices that match all the things um, that we're good at. I'm going to keep going. Another important component, though, is the environment. So you may like doing a certain kind of work, but you also have to think about what is the environment. If you're going to be out on a ship for a day or a month, that's a very different environment than if you work in a school or you work in a corporate setting um, or you work in a restaurant or in a store. So um, how many of you have worked um, in a uh, customer service role, let's say in a restaurant or a store? I assume. I did, too, when I was uh, your age. And um, can someone share what that was like to be in that environment? Sure, right here. Sometimes scary. Why is that? Absolutely. It's a lot of pressure to be in that environment because everyone has different preferences, desires, needs. I remember I was a hostess at a restaurant, and um, sometimes that restaurant even had a two-hour wait, and even estimating how long people would have to wait, and then who got the booth, and, you know, it, it was a high-pressure environment, and you want to serve people and give them a good experience, but for some people, that is really exhilarating, and they like interacting with a lot of people. Um, anyone work in an environment that's a bit more quiet, where maybe you were doing your own projects or your own analysis more in a, in a independent way? And, and what did you do? And then the accounting firm, absolutely. And, um, and how does that, how is that environment? 
Yeah. Right. So I'm probably someone that likes a little of both. Like I like doing my own projects, but I need people. So I'll give um, two examples. I worked at a firm where there were only four offices or five offices on my floor. And I would be in my office doing my work, but then sometimes I would come out and say, hello, hello, hello. And I, I felt a little isolated. Um, I've also worked on a trading floor. I started my career after business school on the uh, equity floor of Merrill Lynch. There were 800 people on that floor. The average age was probably 29. People were in your face. Maybe you had about two feet um, in terms of where you sat, no offices. Candidly, I didn't love it at 7 in the morning, having all those people in my face. Um, I wasn't a coffee drinker yet then. But actually, it was very exhilarating for me to have kind of all that buzz and energy. But I'm probably somewhere in the middle. But really, you should also think about the environment you want to be in. I'll give another example. I spent my summer in business school working in a chocolate factory. And I actually liked the content of the work I was doing, going back to the prior slide but I didn't love the environment. It was a little slow, low key. People didn't seem so charged up, fired up to uh, deliver for uh, the customers um, or to, to sort of um, um, get things done in a, in a fast paced way. And it made me realize that even if I like the content of the work, the environment in which you um, do the work is important as well. Anyone else want to share uh, a place that they've uh, worked that maybe we haven't heard from yet? Sure. Wow. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But you, um, that's a great lead into the next topic, which is culture, but that's certainly a fast paced, high pressure environment, demanding customers. But it sounds like a great um, environment in terms of the teamwork of the folks that work there. Anyone else? I know this is not a shy crowd. OK, so that brings us to culture. That's a great lead in. And in some ways, culture is the most important thing. Culture is really hard to describe. But to me, the best way to describe it is, how do you feel when you walk in the door? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like it's a place that you can thrive? Do you feel like these are your people? Um, do you feel like you can look and act and dress as, and speak the way that you are? Um, when I joined Merrill Lynch out of business school, um, it was a very hard decision at the time. I was actually deciding between two firms. And every person, professor, um, former colleague, you name it, told me to pick the other firm. The other firm was considered more prestigious for whatever reason. But I said, I'm going to Merrill Lynch because I love the culture. I know that my job is going to be so demanding, so stressful, so hard that I want to go work at a firm where I feel that I can be me and that I feel like the people around me are invested in my success and, and will enable me to succeed. This is a really intangible thing. It's a really hard thing. But I would say if you're interviewing somewhere and you feel uncomfortable or you don't see anyone where you say, I want to be like them when I grow up or... I know I'm going to be best friends with that person, then that's not the ideal place for you to work. Pick a place where you walk in the door and you feel like you're at home. I mean, obviously, it's a job. It's not your home, but where you feel like you can be at home, where, again, you feel energized by the people you're working with. You respect them because they're smart. You respect them because they're hardworking. You respect them because you have shared interest, their values the teamwork, the energy, whatever it is that's important to you. And so I would really encourage you as you're picking uh, your first job, your second job, to think, and every job, you think about culture. Um, I made a very, very big move uh, about a year ago after being at one company for a very long time. I was making a change. And before I even interviewed, I wrote on a piece of paper, sort of like the piece of paper each of you have, what is it I was looking for? And it didn't actually have anything about industry. But what it did have were certain cultural elements that were important to me. And not surprising, teamwork was important. Um, so a teamwork, a sense of partnership, a sense of excellence. I wanted a firm that was really excellent at what it did, and people were really striving to be great, whatever that particular uh, field, product, service was. Um, I wanted a firm with very high integrity, um, where people took um, 
their work seriously, but not themselves too seriously. So I wanted a place where I could also have some fun. But again, that's just my views. Each of you have things that are important to you. Um, and the one thing I will say about when I was in your shoes as a um, graduating uh, college student picking my first full-time job, one of the reasons I picked the firm I picked at that time was because I saw a lot of senior women. And I thought, wow, that is a firm where women are thriving and doing well. Even if I don't stay here for my whole career, that's a place where I have a chance to be very, very successful over the long term. So that was something important to me. So really, just something to be cognizant about what's the place that makes you feel confident, excited. Um, that's probably the place where you should go work, even if it's two firms in the same industry. And one of the things that surprised me, as I should say, is even when there's companies that do the same thing, like the big four in accounting, I'm guessing that they have very different cultures, that you could walk in the door of KPMG versus Deloitte versus PwC, and you would get a completely different feeling, and they are all outstanding firms. And I want to give a shout out to Deloitte because, of course, they're hosting us today, which is fantastic. Okay. Anyone have something they want to add about culture or any question on that topic? Okay. We'll keep going. Okay. So some lessons learned. I've been in the workforce for more than 25 years, which is amazing to me because it seems like just yesterday I was in college. Um, first thing, which may seem obvious, is working really, really hard. And I think you've likely heard this before, but you really do make an impression quickly. So in the first three, six months of a job or in the first three, five days, if it's a summer job, just make sure you're the first person there. Hopefully you're the last person there. And show a willingness to help out. So an example would be, let's say your project is, you know, you're wrapped up at mid-afternoon. Ask your boss, ask your colleague, is there something I can do to help you? Even if it's something that may not be your specific responsibility or assignment, show a willingness to help out and work hard. And that is paramount. And through my entire career, um, I have been known as someone that works really hard. And that's sort of baseline. You know, you really need to do that. Um, second thing is to exude enthusiasm and curiosity. If you've picked a certain job, hopefully you are passionate about the topic. You're passionate about um, being a counselor. You're passionate about being a ship captain. You're passionate about being an accountant. And you need to show that. And it's by asking questions. It's about doing excellent work. It's about getting to know your colleagues. Um, and part of that is showing initiative. I have worked with many young people where I'll never forget one young person came to me and said, I really like to work more closely with you. And I said, OK, here's the good news. I'm going to give you some projects, and you're going to get access to me. However, I'm just warning you, sometimes I'm going to ask you to do things like on Friday night that I need before a business trip on Sunday night. Well, to his credit, he said, no problem. And sometimes I would ask him, I need four slides for a meeting in Tokyo on Monday. And he would work all weekend. So he had shown the initiative. But in exchange for that, he got exposure to the head of the group. I would meet with him about his career. I wrote him a recommendation to business school. I've been a reference for him in multiple jobs through his career. And we've developed really an intense uh, mentoring relationship. So that's just one example of someone showing initiative. Um, and then be known for something. So even at a junior level, you could be known as the person that really knows how to satisfy customers, the person that has the fastest uh, um, cappuccino making skills, the person that has a deep expertise in a certain element of a certain industry or in a certain counting standard. And it's something to think about. I'll give an example. When I was in capital markets, I had a passion for the healthcare industry. And at a certain point, I was able to focus on that industry, but my boss said, we need someone to focus on the insurance industry. Now, very few people grow up and think, you know, woohoo, I want to focus on insurance. But at that time, um, I said, of course, um, and September 11th happened, which was a tragic event in our country and in the world, but there was an immense need for capital in the insurance industry. And so out of something that I didn't consider a great opportunity at the time, I became known as an expert in the insurance industry and capital raising and ultimately developed an intense love of that industry. It's really complicated. It has three kinds of accounting, it has its own language. And sort of once you crack the code, you're part of this elite squad that knows it. So that's just an example of when I became an expert in something that I didn't even know I wanted to be an expert in, but really helped my career because I ultimately had uh, a knowledge and expertise that was very rare and very valuable. Um, and then something else is, and I, it really dovetails with what Safra said earlier about asking, 
is don't assume your boss can read your mind. I had a wonderful boss, uh, Jeff Edwards, who's still a friend and a mentor many years later, and he is responsible for telling me that. At one point, I was unhappy about something, um, and he didn't know, and he said, don't assume uh, your boss can read your mind. I also like to say don't assume your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife can read your mind either, but certainly don't assume your boss can read your mind. And what I mean by that is if you would like a new assignment or to be part of a new group or to be transferred overseas or go back to graduate school or get more feedback or you name it, please, please tell your boss. Assume she or he wants to know. And they may not always be willing or able to satisfy exactly what you want at that time, but just the fact that they know what's important to you will help them uh, be a better boss and mentor to you. Um, does anyone have an example of something that they've asked a boss or something that they've wanted um, but they didn't know how to ask for? Yeah. That's a great example. So the content of the work wasn't exactly what you expected. You wanted more programming, and you had the guts to ask. So that's great. Wonderful. Someone else had a? Do we have a mic here as well? Oh, good. We're going to hand around a mic. You can sh Hi, I'm Hi. Danielle. Hello, Danielle. Um, I had a issue at work where I had a different responsibility, but I needed other coworkers to help me with yeah. the thing that I needed to have done. And even though I had asked for it, they weren't doing it because they had other priorities on their list. So I had to talk to my boss about how the workflow worked so that that way she could help reinforce. She asked that from you two weeks ago. Yeah why haven't you done it yet kind of deal. Yeah. So once I learned the way that workflow worked, then everything got done that's and everybody great. was happy. <laughs> well, that took a lot of guts as well because you were asking things of other people and I'm sure you did some improvements to the workflow while you were at it. Anyone else? I'm not sure if I saw other hands. Oh, great. Hey, I'm Rafi. Uh, so I worked actually at an insurance company as a marketing intern. Not exactly what I wanted to be doing, but I did it anyways. And I was essentially doing one role. And so I asked my boss if there were any other projects related to asset management, because that's what I was interested in. Yeah. And after I asked her, she put me on a new project. I didn't actually do any work for it, but I got to hear what was going on in the project. And I got to sit in on calls, which ended up being super valuable. That's fantastic. So that's a great thing as well. Sometimes um, you just want exposure to things you're interested in. And if you can go to meetings with senior people, you have a tremendous opportunity to learn. I know when I started in banking, sometimes I would go to a meeting with a client or with senior colleagues and I would say, I should be paying them. Like this is incredible. I'd practically pinch myself because it was so interesting um, and I learned so much. So good for you to ask for that exposure. And again, that's an example. Your boss can't read your mind. She didn't know that you were more interested perhaps in asset management, but you did get the opportunity to see that. Anyone else? Well, I think you hear that really having um, a sense of what you're interested in and having, again, the courage to ask the worst thing that can happen is the boss says, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask the other members of the team to work with you in this project, or I'm not going to be able to get you exposure to asset management, and you're no worse for having asked. But typically, the boss is going to want to be helpful. And even if they can't do it right away, they'll know in the back of your mind um, that you're interested in something else or want to do something different, and they'll try and uh, keep you motivated. Okay. So... How many of you know what you're doing after college and actually have a job that you've accepted? Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, but most people are still either underclassmen or are still interviewing. Um, depending on the environment, it can take a very long time to get a job. And I've had lots of college students come see me through the years. Um, sometimes they really want a job that's very hard to get. Sometimes um, they may not have the best experience or transcript and it's going to be a little harder. And um, I remember meeting with one during a tough time in the economy and he said, what do I need to do to get a job? And I said, you're going to need to meet 50 people. And lo and behold, he met 50 people and he still didn't have a job. So I said, oh, sorry, I said 50, but I meant 100. 
Um, and interestingly, this has now been a piece of advice I've shared many times, and it, I have to say, it works. And what I mean by that is if you're still looking for a job and maybe for what you want to do or because of where we are in the calendar or the business environment, the job you want is not coming to your campus or it's not right in front of you, a great way to get a job is to meet 100 people. And 100 people can start with um, someone that's a recent graduate that works at a company where you may want to work. Maybe it's someone, a neighbor that works in the field you're interested in. Maybe it's someone that your professor or teacher introduced you to. Do, to. Maybe it's someone uh, that went to your high school that was a few years ahead of you. There are many, many, many ways to meet people that can help you find a job. And if you're going to meet 100 people or even 50 or 20, I would suggest you create a spreadsheet so you remember who did you meet, what do they do, where do they work, what's their contact information in terms of their email or cell phone, so that depending on how long it takes, you're circling back to those people and staying in touch. And the reason why this is so powerful is even if that person doesn't have a job, you want them thinking about you so that the next time they run into someone, either at their firm, their neighbor, someone on an airplane, and they say, gosh, we have been trying for six months to hire a ship captain. You say, bingo, I just met someone that's fantastic and you should hire her. Or we need to hire someone for our accounting department or in asset management, they are thinking of you. Um, as part of this, though, if you're going to meet people, you need to ask great questions. And I can't tell you how many times when I'm interviewing someone or meeting someone as part of a networking meeting, and they either don't have many questions or even any questions. Or so they'll say something to me like, well, someone else already answered my questions. Okay, here's a very important piece of advice. You should never, ever, ever run out of questions. If you have an opportunity to sit with Safra Cass and you have five hours, you should still not have run out of questions. Seriously. There's endlessly interesting things you can ask her. How did you get into technology? How did you know you wanted to be a CEO? Do you have a favorite initiative? What do you look for in talent you want to hire? What do you do when you're not working? How do you find time to be at a conference like she believes? You should literally be overflowing with questions when you go to meet someone. And so that's a lot to remember off the top of your head. So I shared a few of my favorite questions to be asked, but you should think of your own questions. And, and I, I don't really expect you to have 50 questions top of mind, but you certainly should have three to five. And let's say you're going to interview at a firm and you have a series of interviews. You have five or 10 interviews. Even if you've asked nine people in a row, the same five questions, when you get to number 10 and she or he says to you, do you have any questions? Ask the same questions. You may say, well, gosh, I just asked nine people. You will learn something different. They all have a different experience. They all have different backgrounds. And even if they say the same thing, which I sincerely doubt, it will only make you smarter when you're interviewed. So an example, when someone asks me, what makes someone successful that works for you? And then I answer that question. When she goes and interviews with the next person and they say, why do, will you be good in this role? You've just heard from the boss what it takes to be successful in this job. So I really encourage you, think about five questions that you're going to ask and never, never, never say, I have no more questions or um, I asked the people before you. And I would also say that most senior people really like to talk about their career and themselves. So a very good interview can be an interview where you're actually not talking that much, as funny as that seems. Does anyone have a um, crazy interview question that they've been asked or something surprising from an interview that you would be comfortable sharing? Oh, we got, we're going to get you the mic now. And I'm sorry, I didn't tell the squad here that I was going to be asking you questions. So thank you for finding the mics for them. This is more of a behavioral one. Sure. But, um, Explain to someone who has never heard of tic-tac-toe how to play the game of tic-tac-toe. Oh, my God. That's really hard. Yeah. By the way, if you ever get a tricky question, and it could be tic-tac-toe or how many gas stations in the United States, which <laughs> consulting firms ask, it's okay to say, that is a fantastic question. I am so fired up to tackle that one when I have more time. Here's how I would approach thinking about that question. So never say, like, I wouldn't know, you know. But if you don't know, you can admit, you know, when I was getting asked some more technical finance questions and I had not taken finance, I would say, listen, I don't know how to do a discounted cash flow analysis right now, but I promise you I'm going to be a very quick study 
but where I can add a lot of value from day one is in terms of writing, in terms of presentation building, you know, go to your strengths. But uh, I don't think I could describe tic-tac-toe. It was actually a written question. A written question. Oh, my God. I so how did you do on that? I a six-page response. Did so it go okay? I'll know next week. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Uh, oh, over here. Um, I was asked if I could be part of a cult, which one would it be? Which cult? Yeah, and I was like, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I hope you said women's soccer. Well, like, <laughs> like, like, like political cults. Oh, and I God, was like, that's a tough question. Yeah, it was, it was very intimidating. <laughs> that is, that is very odd. Okay, anyone else? One here. The question I was asked was, if you were to pick a song, which song would describe your life? Oh, that's so good. My answer was, go the distance from Hercules. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so that is a very good segue to the next section. How many of you played sports in high school or college? Okay, we need a photo of that. Um, we don't have a camera. I didn't bring out my phone. But okay, so here is something amazing, which I don't know if you knew. But 85% of women executives, and we know we have one future executive in the back, um, played sports in high school or college. So I don't think that's a surprise. Business is really hard work, is tenacity, is going the distance, teamwork, and just a desire to win. Um, any other thoughts about why so many um, athletic women are so successful in the world? We have some women back here. Great. Okay, two in the row, so it'll be efficient with the mic. Obviously, the tenacity aspect is important, but just the teamwork and leadership aspects yeah. as well. You even in I, I actually work right now. I'm not in college, but yeah. um, the teamwork and leadership aspects. Having been on a, a soccer team, yeah. um, you really bring so much of that into your career, and being able to bring people together for an e a overall end goal is really important. So yeah. teamwork, leadership, focusing on a goal. And did someone else in the same role have a comment? Um, you can learn from your failures. So absolutely. Like, um, I do CrossFit and yeah. I put it like in my in my career or professional yeah. life. Like I know if if I cannot get a uh, weightlifting right away, I know if I keep practicing, I will get it. Yeah. So that's how I do it, like, with my career. I know if I, I cannot get it right away, if I keep practicing, I will get it one day. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Oh, we have some more here. You know, it's interesting. I ran track in college. I was a sprinter, but I like to hire long-distance athletes because I think they suffer. So I've hired cross-country runners and people that swim the mile, and I'm like, that is someone that is going to run through walls, literally. Um, but I think athletes are great colleagues, and for all the reasons you mentioned, um, there's a reason why there's so many of us in the senior ranks. Okay. I was also just going to add, like, everyone here who's played the sport knows that it takes up a lot of time, and yeah. so if you're not well organized and managing your time well, you can really fall behind on schoolwork and stuff. So. I think that organization is really key when you get to a job that you might be working crazy hours to be able to take time like for yourself and also um, put extra time in after. So, Yep. I think we have another comment or two up here. I would add the responsibility. We, you know, through generations, girls that have taken their sport extra after practice or after games and, and did the individual work yeah. but now we have that as almost a standard that if you're going to make it in college you probably did a lot more work outside of practice so, so that true. responsibility is coming at a younger age and it's more and there's a little more pressure on it yeah so. yeah I think maybe behind yeah thank you uh, I would like to add the point of discipline to time management just yeah. because if you have to plan your time because of sports, you also have to put in the discipline to actually sit down and do what you plan have planned just because you don't have the time to do it afterwards because there's just the pressure of always being in practice and everything. It's pretty incredible. You know, I, um, I mentioned I ran track. I didn't for my one semester because I had an injury, 
and that was my lowest GPA of the four years, which is so counterintuitive because theoretically I had so much more time, but because I didn't have that scheduling, that intensity, that discipline, and so I'm someone that I know the busier I am, the better I am, and to borrow from Billie Jean King, pressure is a privilege. So the more pressure we're under as athletes, as students, as career women, I think we really thrive. I also have another um, theory about um, why um, women that are athletes do so well in the business world, and that is because the language of business is the language of sports. So this is something fun. So when I was working on the trading floor, so much of the lingo was from sports. You know, we're going to run through the tape, we're going to block and tackle, et cetera, et cetera. Now, these are some funny quotes that aren't all from the same sport. We've got, we've got um, blocking and tackling, which obviously is football, running through the tape, that's track, full court press, basketball, keep your eyes on the ball, that could be tennis, the gloves are off, boxing, the ball's in their court, again, another uh, tennis, um, have someone in your corner, boxing, and down to the wire, which actually has horse racing. These are just eight examples. There must be 80. And in fact, I once um, hired someone on our desk who was not very sporty, and he um, was from um, Belgium or France, and he said, what should I read? This was on, in finance. And I, I said, well, you should read Barron's and the Wall Street Journal, but you should also read Sports Illustrated. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, really? His name was Olivier. I said, you should read Sports Illustrated. I said, that is the language of business. That is the language of the trading floor, number one. Number two, your colleagues and clients care passionately about sports. So when you're pitching business, when you're um, by the, the coffee machine with your colleagues, nine out of 10 of my colleagues, female or male, want to talk about what's going on, whether it's the Women's World Cup this summer in France, whether it's what's going on with their favorite you know, hockey team, basketball team, baseball team. In fact, when I used to be on the road pitching business, I would look up the sport um, schedule and results of the local team. So if I was going to Cincinnati, um, I would actually look up you know, what are the Bengals or the Reds doing. And if it was you know, in April, I knew that they have actually a parade for opening day for baseball in Cincinnati. How cool is that? But whatever it was, that's just one example. And when you're talking to clients, colleagues, most people, I'd say 90% of people in business, care about something in sports. And by the way, it could be that they do CrossFit or they cycle 50 miles on the weekend or they support a certain team. Um, but being comfortable with the lingo of sports, being comfortable talking of sports, having a sport um, that you love and support, um, that's actually a very easy way to build relationships. Um, I actually find another topic that's really easy to talk to people about is their vacation. Like every human being either has taken a vacation, will take a vacation, or would like to take a vacation. So it's a very easy thing to say, any plans over spring break or any plans this summer? And again, that's another example of something that nine out of 10 people will be delighted to say, yeah, we're thinking of going skiing, or oh, I'd love to go to Florida, or nothing planned now, but hope to do something over the summer. Okay. So as you think about your career, and not just your first job, but your career, I really advise that you build what I call your personal board of directors. So many people talk about mentors, that's important, but a personal board of directors is empowering for a few reasons. One, it doesn't need to be all senior people. It could be a boss, a former boss. It could be a neighbor who's someone you admire. Maybe it's your best friend from high school's mom or dad who's in a field you're focused on. It could be your classmate. It could be someone you meet here today at this summit. When I think of my personal board of directors, the other thing I would say is it evolves. I've had people that are very important in my career who have subsequently left the industry or left the firm or retired and maybe they're not as critical in my day to day. So that's why I suggest you should have a group of six to 12 people because I promise you over five or 10 years, that group will evolve and you never wanna to get to the point that you have no one. Um, some of the best professional advice and support I get are from friends that do very different things. So while I have been in finance and business my entire career, when I think of my personal board of directors, it includes a high school teacher, a head of an all girls school, someone who's a professor, someone who is in a consulting firm, um, and the, uh, someone who works in HR. And the point to that is to say, not everyone needs to be in your field, but I really gravitate towards um, folks that are successful in what they do, who have a sense of mission and purpose, that are upbeat, 
um, and that know me well. And what I have found from these folks is that um, they do different things at different times. Sometimes you need someone that cheers you on because maybe you got some bad news at work, you didn't get the promotion you wanted or the raise or it's not going well, and you need someone to say, it's okay, you know, keep going. Sometimes you need a kick in the pants. Sometimes you need someone to say to you, hey, Lisa, you've been miserable in that job. You need to move on or you need to ask for more. You need to make a change. Um, sometimes you need a sounding board. So you need different things at different times, but really think about who are the people you trust, that admire, that know you well, that have your back. And I would suggest you actually start a list and think, who are my board of directors? And it's not something that you ask someone, hey, Susie, will you be on my board of directors? I've never had that conversation. It's more that who are the people that are invested in your professional and personal success that would do anything for you so that if you say, oh my God, I have a really critical decision to make tomorrow, you know, the company wants me to move to Hong Kong, can you get on the phone? Or I'm thinking of quitting my job, or how do I ask for a raise, or I'm thinking of going to graduate school, that these are the people that you'd really like to ask for their advice. And again, you would do the same for them. Um, so they are really both your friends, but they serve a specific role in thinking about your professional success. And this is not something that I was thinking about when I was your age, but something that has evolved over my career and again is simply um, invaluable. And I would say you could really look very far afield. It could be a relative and again a neighbor, um, someone you know and admire a lot and like. And so this is something you should think about now and continue to think about um, over the coming years. Anyone have someone now that they view as an advisor or a mentor or on their board of directors? Right there, right in the middle, sorry. Um, my coach, who's Wonderful. Right Yay, I love that. Well, that's fantastic, you're very lucky and that's wonderful and you can have that relationship forever. So kudos to you, anyone else? Okay, right here in front. Um, my former boss, Your he former? brought me into the field and he's been a great sounding board, especially now that I'm looking to change jobs. That's wonderful. So there's a young woman that I helped bring into Bank of America Merrill Lynch about five years ago. And subsequently, we've both left the firm. I'm now at Alex Partners. She's now at a small PE firm. She's coming to see me on Tuesday afternoon because I'm still a mentor to her, even though um, we don't work at the same firm. We've both moved into different directions. But I, I'm very happy that that relationship will endure. And I'm sure your former boss also gets great joy and satisfaction in maintaining that relationship. So really great. Anyone else? Right here. And you have to tell us how you decided to be a ship captain. Well, that's why my mentor is actually my chief mate, who is also one of my professors in some of my classes. That's wonderful. And yeah. That's great. Okay, we have one more in back. Oh, and here in front. And right next to you. Sorry. <laughs> um, my university senior woman administrator. She yeah. wasn't my coach directly, but she was a coach at Stevens. But she um, advocated for so many athletes that weren't even on her team. So. So I went to Columbia and there's a woman, Jackie Blackett, who's the equivalent. And I mean, she's been a mentor and advisor to me for 30 years. And you think about the thousands of women athletes and male athletes, but that she has advised, mentored, helped. It's, it's staggering. It's amazing. Okay, we have a few more here and in back. Um. <clears throat> My guidance counselor, she's really helped me out since I still haven't graduated high school and I still haven't really gotten to touch upon life just yet. Yeah. So I'm kind of still new to all of it, but she has really helped me in kind of skipping the grade and graduating this year. So it's been really tough. So she's like someone I kind of have on my board of directors in a way. That's wonderful. Well, you should thank her and that's extraordinary that she's helped you in that way. Mm. Okay, I think we have one more in back. Did I miss someone? Oh, good. I have a question. Sure. Do you ask someone to mentor you or you think it happens natural? That's a great question. So I've been part of many formal mentoring programs, both as the mentee and the mentor. And I would say my personal experience has been sort of mixed. For my 
um, view, from my view, it works best when it's organic because you have a shared interest. You've worked on a project together. You've been on a team together. Maybe you have uh, a shared passion for CrossFit or soccer or you grew up in the same place or something. So for me, the most successful mentoring relationships both ways have been where it's more organic. But I know a lot of people had success when they've been formally matched in a program. And it's OK to ask someone. I, I've been asked many times. Um, sometimes I've had to say to people, listen, I don't have a ton of time, but I'm happy to be a resource to you if you need advice, if you need a call, if you need some support. But at this point, I don't have, you know, I'm not going to be meeting with you every month and to make sure there's sort of shared expectation. But I think it's an honor to be asked to be a mentor, and most people would really appreciate it. I would just really focus on someone where you think, again, that you have a, sort of a shared spirit, and they're invested in your success. So be thoughtful. And by the way, you can have more than one mentor. So thank, thank you. you. So that's a great lead in to where I wanted to finish, which was with questions. So I know I've asked you a lot of questions. But are there any questions that any of you have um, in our final couple of minutes um, on your careers. So I have a prepared one. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> so y I read in your bio that you worked on a Women's Leadership Council for Athletics. Yes. Um, I wrote a paper with a professor of mine on millennial D1 through D3 athletes and what their perceptions of leaders were. And the answer that we found most resounding was that they viewed leadership as someone who takes up a cause. Mm. So in your experience with that leadership council, mm. what did you find? So um, when I went to Columbia, um, my first year, the seniors were all men. Columbia had just gone co-ed, which is sort of amazing. Um, and the women's teams were very new. We had been D3, uh, um, but then became D1. But we had just a few teams. Frankly, we were not very good. Um, and while it was a significant part of my experience, it wasn't, um, there wasn't so much support and history with the women's teams because we were new. So when I was out of school about 20 years, a group of my sort of um, peers, meaning my generation. So I ran track, some friends from the tennis team. We said, we successful women should give back to the current women's athletes and raise money for women's sports. And let me just give you a sense. The year we started this, which was 11 years ago, Columbia raised a total of about $50,000 for women's athletics. Um, this past year, we raised close to a million dollars. So it took us a decade, but that is quite a ramp. And how did we do it? We developed the Women's Leadership Council for Athletics, and we said, hey, women graduates, it's time to support our women's teams. Um, and we would do events. We do an event in the fall with um, the coaches and graduates that support, and other friends that support the teams. Sometimes in the spring, we do a luncheon that has more of a, like a speaker series, that sort of thing. And then we do events where we go back to support the teams and the women get together. And I have to say, of all the ways I've been involved in Columbia, and I'm now co-chair of the trustees, this is one of the most meaningful things I have done. When I go to these events, the esprit de corps in the room, and it's not just with my teammates. I could be talking to the women's field hockey coach. I could be talking to a recent alum who played soccer. But women supporting women, it just doesn't get better than that. And you know, I see this in all ways in my life. Last March at the She Believes Summit, um, the next day we had um, one of the matches. Our women's national team was playing France out at Red Bull Arena. I went. Um, and who was sitting next to um, the seats that I was in? Um, the women's national hockey team, just off their gold medal in the Olympics. And I thought, wow. I mean, women supporting women. I mean, I had the chills. It was fantastic. They were thrilled to be there. Of course, we all wanted to touch their gold medals and meet them. Um, but that's just, you know, there are many examples of women supporting women, women lifting up the next generation of women. Um, it's something that certainly is a cause for me and something that inspires me. But the Women's Leadership Council at Athletics at Columbia has been very successful. Um, and it's something that I would be happy for all schools to replicate. There's no, um, we didn't trademark this. This is something that should be borrowed and improved upon at, at many schools. And the money that we've raised enable our teams to do things like go on spring break trips, buy a new van, get maybe hire an assistant coach, buy some new equipment. So it's really having tangible effects on our programs. And our programs have never been 
more successful. So, anyone else? Okay, right here. Hi, my name's Elena. Hello. Um, I just started my full-time career, and the transition from student to full-time employee has been interesting. I found that the path in school is much more linear, right? Like you have things that you're supposed to do each year, and uh, now in the workforce, it's much more open-ended. So I have colleagues that are studying for their CFA, colleagues that are leaving to go to PE firms, to go to business school, to go to startups, and so it's all very interesting, and I'm not exactly sure what my step is uh, that I want to be working towards. And so I'm wondering if you have a view on or any advice on how to set long-term goals when you might not exactly be sure what should be next for you. Right. Um, another great question. So um, I'd say a few things. One, believe it or not, I rarely set long-term goals. My view was I want to be the best I can be at the level I'm at. So if, there was, um, if I was an associate at Merrill Lynch, I wanted to be rated the highest and paid the most for an associate at Merrill Lynch. I wasn't even necessarily focused on when am I going to be a VP or did I want to leave. I just wanted to be great at what I was doing, assuming I was loving the work. Um, if I were you, I would give yourself two or three things that you would like to accomplish over the next year so that if we're sitting here in March of 2020 and I say, how's it going? I say, God, it was such a great year because I developed my expertise on this. I got to work on a project like this and I built relationships with these people or whatever it is. So that way you know you're making forward motion. At the same time, I do think it's important periodically to step back and think about, should I get my CFA? Should I go to graduate school? Is this field the field I want to stay in or should I be looking at PE or something else? But believe it or not, for me, I was more in the keep your head down, work hard, um, and good things will happen. Um, and then if I saw something I wanted to do, I would raise my hand and say, you know, I'm ready to do more, I'm ready to travel, I'm ready to whatever the case may be. But make sure that you're learning and advancing this year so that next year you feel like you've made progress. Thank you. Do we have time? We're okay? We have to wrap it up. One more question. Okay, who's next? Ah. Who did, did you didn't ask a question yet? So this woman in, in the middle here. Hi, um, my name is Danya, and I had a question about interns yeah. and internships. So I have an internship coming up this summer, which could potentially turn into a full-time position. Yeah. So I was wondering, as an intern working alongside other interns, what I can do to sort of just make yourself stand out or build a good relationship with the company so that that can turn into a full-time. Absolutely. And I'd say more and more full-time jobs are determined through the summer internship. I think it's the same thing. It's the coming early, staying late, showing enthusiasm and curiosity. And I don't know if this internship has a project as part of the structure, but if it doesn't, I would very early ask your boss, I would love to have a project and so it's something that you present at the end of the summer or you put together, it will give you a tremendous sense of accomplishment and will really show what you've learned and what you could contribute to the company. So I would definitely try and do a project if you can. And to the extent that you know midway through the summer that you would like to return there full time, don't be shy in saying so. I'm sure you'll be assigned either a mentor or a go-to, uh, um, even if it's your boss, and to say, you know, I'm really loving it here. I would like nothing more than to return full time next year. That's a great thing to hear, and particularly if they don't have positions available for everyone, mm -hmm. um, knowing that you'll, you'll say yes is, uh, is something very powerful. So good luck. I think we need to wrap up. I want to thank you all. It's been wonderful being with you this morning, and thank you.